Okay, welcome everyone. I hope you can hear me all. Uh, welcome to this um, kind of, you know, joint event, but it's actually one event connected, uh, where we have um, a talk in relation to the launch of uh, the land, the Palestine Land Studies Center at AUB in Beirut, and a lecture by Professor Salman Abusate about the 11 year wars against Palestinians. Um, I'm Dina Matar, I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies. I will introduce the speakers uh, shortly. Um, the, way that, the way that this works is uh, we are letting people in still, and we have at the, end, at the bottom of your screen, you, you find a question and answer um, uh, icon, which you could put your questions in, and then I will pose them uh, to uh, the speakers tonight. Uh, also, welcome to those people attending via Facebook. We also, uh, if you could post your questions uh, in the chat box so we can connect them. And just before we start, sometimes we, we might have a lot of questions, so we might not be able to go, every, to go through every question. So I do apologize uh, before we, I start. Um, this, uh, this series of uh, lectures, book launches, and talks are sponsored by the SOAS Middle East Society, of which the Center for Palestine Studies is one of the, one of the uh, key centers. And we hold them every Tuesday during uh, term time. And we thank the SME, SMEI for hosting this and for Aki El Bursi for uh, being the master of the ceremonies. Without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Huwaida uh, Al Harithi, um, who is uh, going to talk to us about uh, the uh, Land Studies Center, the first one in relation to Palestine at AUB. It's a very great, um, you know, uh, achievement. And the achievement could not have happened without Dr. Salman Abusitte, a relentless, a relentless scholar, academic, actor, activist and supporter of Palestinian human rights and Palestinian rights. Um, he, has been, um, he has been a role model, if I can use that, for uh, many people, including myself, in his uh, achievements and in his persistence uh, to try and engage the world, if not the scholarly community, with uh, what happens to Palestine and to Palestinians. He is... Um, he is the founder and president of the Palestine Land Society, and he has written so many interesting books, including um, the, uh, the uh, author of the Comparative Atlas of Palestine, which I think he told me today it has been translated into Italian, correct? The memoirs are. Ah, memoirs. No, Nothing might attend. Yeah, and he has done an atlas of, um, atlas of the return journey but one of his most kind of really fascinating books, apart from all his documentation and uh, data supported uh, material that he has um, shared with, with the world and with us, he has written this fantastic memoir, which is Mapping My Return, which has been translated into more, more re into most recently Italian and other um, languages. Without further ado, I welcome both of you. Uh, Dr. Al Harthi is going to talking to us from Lebanon, and uh, Professor Abu Sita is talking to us from Kuwait. So it's a really transnational kind of event, uh, reflecting the Palestinian um, diaspora, exile, whatever we could talk about. So without further ado, Hawaii, may I give you the platform to start, and then um, uh, Professor Abu Sita. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Dina, for the introduction. Thank you for hosting us. It's really a serious pleasure for me to be here, uh, especially to be here on behalf of AUB um, and briefly introducing the newly established Palestine Land Studies Center at AUB as its founding director. Um, this is a, a very, very joyous occasion for me. I'll be very brief and I'll tell you a little bit about the vision and the mission of the center. Uh, the Palestine Land Studies Center, which we call PLSC at the American University of Beirut was established 
back in September of 2019 as part of the institution's ongoing commitment to the preservation, reclamation, and dissemination of Palestinian history. So it was a really historic landmark for EUB to engage in uh, one of the most central issues of the um, issue. The PLSC um, will create a permanent home for an extensive archives donated by Dr. Salman Abu Sitte uh, and the Palestine Land Society in London. It will activate the archives through research and academic practices and will make them available for both the public uh, interacting with them from within and outside of, of AUB and particularly scholars. So the center's primary aims really include the documentation, preservation of Palestinian history, memory and social publications um, and the organization of innovative teaching. Um, this is also all besides the creation of of a far-reaching network, hopefully, of scholars, academics, and professionals dedicated for the Palestinian cause. So we wanted to work across disciplines and geographies. Uh, the PLSC um, aims to really attract researchers from around the globe who are interested in scholarship surrounding territory, people, and social histories of Palestine. It will, um, in turn, provide access for maps, documents, data sets, and objects that are unique and unpublished in some instances on a regional scale. Um, it will create a hub of sorts for pioneering, forward-looking, um, result-oriented research, methodology, and pedagogy, and will certainly try and thrive to serve to expand the scope of its impact across the globe by networking with institutions of similar interest and caliber, such as yourself. So we're here partly today to build that network as well. Um, to give you a quick and brief idea of the collection itself uh, that was donated by Dr. Abu Sitta, and in, uh, where we are in the process of transferring incrementally, both digitally and um, tangibly. The archives are really exposed of around, uh, composed of around 7,000 books, over 300 maps, around 450,000 registration deeds. Archives contain extremely therefore material, um, uh, important maps, special items such as British Mandate Survey maps, valuable contribution uh, for AUB's archive. Importantly, it's research agenda. We take serious pride in being a liberal arts college whose research is leading in the region and globally. And this is certain to give us um, a further edge uh, that marks our research that is uh, meaningful to our region and impact oriented. So I hope we succeed in doing that with all your help. I hope you stay connected. You keep Thank you so much. I turn the floor over to Dr. Abu Sitta. Um, Dr. Selma, if you want to start. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dina Mata, for your kind words and for inviting me here. And thanks also to our friend, uh, Dr. Gilbert Ashkar, who has joined us now, I'm glad to say. Uh, I'm not a stranger to Suez. Uh, I have many friends past and present, and I attended and participated in many functions. And Suez is a friendly, warm, civilized, and thought-provoking home. So it's good to come here again, even though it is virtually. I think back on our case in Palestine, and it often comes to my mind how I am ashamed of future generations who will read our history in the 20th and 21st century and wonder how we in this age could live with so much injustice, so many war crimes carried out for so long without remorse or remedy, with so much deception, so many falsehoods, 
so many lies. Such lies could have been verified by bringing up easily found facts, easily found facts, if and only if these facts were allowed to be known. My country, Palestine, has been stricken by two devastating attacks in the last 1,000 years, appropriately described as barbarian for what they have done. Both came from Central Western Asia and Eastern Europe. Both caused unbelievable death and destruction. Both got help from Western powers hostile to us. One was defeated soundly, the other not yet. The first was the Mongol attack led by Hulaku Khan. In 1258, they reduced Baghdad to rubble. They destroyed its houses, palaces, and mosques. They killed 200,000, possibly more. They destroyed valuable manuscripts in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and threw them in the Tigris River. Its water became black with ink. They plundered and looted everything in sight. They forged alliance against us with Frankish European crusaders. And they were finally defeated at Ain Jalut in Palestine on the 3rd of September, 1860. The second is the Haganah attack led by Ben Gurion in March, 1948. They came roughly from the same area, Al Khazar, north of Black Sea and Eastern Europe. They destroyed over 500,000 villages, including 150,000 houses. They plundered and looted houses, businesses, banks, and public properties. They committed 156 massacres and atrocities, killed tens of thousands, and made millions homeless refugees until today. They did not destroy documents, but looted them and used them to seize land, properties, banks, schools, hospitals, railways, airports, and seaports. They, fought, they forged a solid alliance with the Western powers, particularly UK and USA. They are not defeated yet, but I'm sure they will be sometime in Palestine. It's still with us. It is waging many kinds of wars against us. Not many attacks. These attacks are daily by land, sea, and air. I'm talking about different kinds of wars. The first kind of war against us is military. To conquer and seize the land. It is a war we all know about in name, but not about its ex extent and purpose. It is a war in which the Haganah forces composed of 120,000 soldiers, mostly trained in Second World War, organized in nine brigades, entered a land they have not seen before, carried out 31 military operations in the space of eight months. And in this period, 560 Palestinian cities and villages were attacked and emptied of its people making refugees of two thirds of the Palestinian people. Today, there are 7 million refugees, but half of them were expelled before there was something called Israel, before the British left Palestine and before any Arab regular soldier entered Palestine. This is the enduring Nakba. The second war which followed is silencing the voice of the victims, denying they ever existed. In 1948, about five dozen major massacres took place. None was reported by the five Western news agencies at the time, except perhaps the Yassin, and then only lightly. Reports about the most horrendous massacre of Al Dawaima in October 1948, in which up to 500 people were savagely killed was called, I quote, a figment of oriental imagination. By whom? By the Israeli UN representative, Walter Etan. 
We have another Israeli settler, C.P. Hotovli, recently installed as Israel's ambassador in the United Kingdom. She called a Nakba an Arab lie. Mention of a Nakba is outlawed in Israel, but it took four decades for some courageous historians like Ilan Pepe to expose the truth. This truth is still denied in many US universities at the pain of cutting off its funds. Now we come to the third war, third kind of war. It's geographical. Our Atlas of Palestine, 1917 to 1966, lists 55,000 names carved by the people about their life and places. The Israeli maps eliminated all of them and replaced them with 6,800 names, almost one-tenth of the original. And these were created by a committee. So if you look at Israeli maps today, Palestine does not exist. The fourth kind of war is historical. The historical record of Palestine in the last 2,000 years is obliterated and made blank in the Israeli textbooks, in the Zionist-controlled media, and removed from controlled websites elsewhere. It is replaced by a history of settler Jews who arrived in Palestine after the First World War. 2,000 years of Palestine's history for which historical edifices are still abound are totally deleted from record. But not only our history is erased, but our living traditions of dress, food, and songs are expropriated and claimed to be that of the invader. The fifth kind of war is archaeological. The destruction of about 500 Palestinian villages in 1948 and 49 <clears throat> was carried out by bulldozers of the Jewish National Fund and Public Works. But there is another anomaly. A strange team accompanied the destruction team. What is this team? It is an Israeli archaeological team which supervised the demolition and ordered the destruction of any building or structures until it was found useful for claims of Jewish history. Their work destroyed Roman, Byzantine, Arab, and Islamic monuments and structures in these villages. Now, those kinds of wars, as you can see, are converting evil into a virtue. I'm borrowing this idea from a forthcoming book by Sari Magdasi, How to Convert Evil into a Virtue. Let us imagine this for a moment. How did the Palestinian landscape look like after the destruction of hundreds of villages? Maybe you can see a pile of stones where a house once stood. Maybe you can see a lone standing wall of a mosque. Maybe you can see a cracked bell tower of a church or a marble piece of a grave. This evil scene must be hidden. And it was covered with trees, woods, forests, planted by non-indigenous trees. The cover-up was hailed as a campaign of making the desert bloom. Hardly any leader in the Western world or a city thereof in which Jewish communities had influence was not immortalized by a park name or a tree. And who's doing that? It was, and it is, the Jewish National Fund, JNF, which directed the Haganah operations uh, in 1948 to attack villages. G GNF, JNF seized the land of 372 villages. And the people now live in refugee camps. And GNF is registered in 41 countries as a tax-free charity. What for? For the improvement of the environment. I imagine George Orwell would fail to beat that. 
The sixth kind of war is political. Next to the military war, this is the most effective. The US and many Western countries vote against UN resolutions condemning Israeli crimes and violation of international law. They thwart any legal action against Israel. The actions of the departing Trump is a supreme example of trampling upon international law. Well, very likely there will be more little Trumps in the West. But we have a pleasant surprise. On Friday, February 5th, the ICC, the National Court of, Just, uh, of Criminal Court, admitted the obvious. Israel is liable to be tried for its war crimes. Well, let us hope it will not be aborted. The seventh kind of war waged against us is religious. God is recruited to win this war. Zionism claim that the uh, Zionists claim that they have the right to return after a 2000 years absence. Where to? To the God given land to recover their property and expel the natives. The evangelists, Trump's main supporters, and they are the former restorationists of the 19th century, are recruited to support Zionism with great effect in the United States. The eighth war against us is defamation. Palestinian fighters and supporters are called terrorists. Edward Said is called a professor of terror. Anyone who explains the facts about Palestine, even among respected scholars or even UN officials, is called an anti Semite. As you will know, the Zionist inspired IHRA document is pushed for adoption by UK universities with limited success. It's an open season for defamation of Palestinians. The ninth war against us, kind of war against us, is lawfare. Domestic law in some Western countries criminalizes support for the grassroots campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS. And hence, any attempt to criticize Israel war crimes and apartheid will be criminalized. As you may have heard, there is a witch hunt in Germany against any mention of Israeli crimes against Palestinians. And there is a twist to that. The people who are criticized witch hunt, subject of witch hunt, are sometimes Jews like Nerit Sommerfeld, who simply dare to speak about Palestinian uh, situation. The 10th war is economic. Jewish financial power in the United States supporting APAC activity is a potent force. Trump, as you know, cut UNRWA funds. Israel strangles the economic conditions in the West Bank and converts people into economic hostages. The Israeli imposed blockade of Gaza for 15 years is now making life unlivable, according to the United Nations. The aim, of course, is for people to demand bread to live instead of the right to live free. The 11th war against us is the most sinister of all. It may be called attritional genocide. As you know, convention of genocide includes a clause which says it includes a coordinated plan aimed at the destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups. In 2018 and 19, during the Great Return March in Gaza, Israel injured 35,600 protesters. Of those, 6,650 were hit deliberately by Israeli snipers, shattering their knees. Today, you can hardly find a street in Gaza without the sight of a youth with an amputated leg. The attacks by poisonous gas in Gaza and the West Bank led to deformity in the newborn, 
with increased incidence of Down syndromes. Now, as you read in the news, Israel is denying vaccine to reach Palestinians in the occupied territories. Well, that's not even to speak of demolished homes and uprooting trees. These sinister acts lead to the disability of a whole generation, imposing a huge burden on their families and on the economy. The outcome is a shattered society incapable of living normally, let alone fight for their rights. This is a genocide of the living. Now, with this review of 11 kinds of wars, I could say the following. Nothing like this array of wars exists in colonial history. Of course, there are colonial cases of more savagery, more people killed or driven away, more territory seized, but never before there was such a wide ranging scale of different wars pre-planned and executed by well-organized troops and groups conducted not from one, one metropole, but from many Western countries where centers of power there aided and abetted these wars. All this was not in the age of bow and arrow, but the age of planes, telephones, and TV, not in the age of pirate ships and free scale savagery, but in the age of the United Nations and Reuters agency, not in a, rem in a remote, unknown, uncharted continent, but in a, in a venerated ancient country, the cradle of Christianity, to which many of these Western countries belong. Will this venture succeed? It did in part. Will it continue? Let us ob observe some facts. The people in Palestine at the time of the infamous Barbara Declaration were only 700,000. At the year of Nakba in 1948, they were 1.7 million. Now, they are 13 million. In the year 2030, they will be 18 million. Half of them are still on Palestinian soil, but they are living under occupation and apartheid rule. 85% of the other half are in the borders of Palestine, within walking distance of their homes. And the remainder is scattered in no less than 100 cities around the world. So we can conclude the Palestinian people are here to stay and they will not go away. But can they return home? Could this unique tragedy end? Well, we know the international law is solidly behind them. Resolution 194 calling for the return of the refugees has been affirmed 135 times more and longer than any resolution in your own history. We realize that international law is no more than an expression of good conscience, but it can be, and it is actually, a tool of the powerful to strike the weak. Nevertheless, it is the conscience of the masses. When they speak, they have a powerful voice. So here we have it. Against international law, Zionism built a solid wall of several layers. First, occupation. There is not a single kilometer in Israel acquired at any time by legal means, not one. All obtained by collusion, but mostly by brute force. Second layer of the, this wall is apartheid. Now, there is no need for Israelis to pretend otherwise. Israel proclaimed the nation state law in July 2018. B'Tselem report of December 2020 confirmed apartheid in all of Palestine, whether occupied in 1948 or 1967. But before both of them, the United Nations ESQA report in March 2017 published its report 
about apartheid Israel. It got buried in the United Nations. The third layer of the wall is racism. There are at least 55 laws uh, applied against Israeli Palestinian citizens today. The fourth layer is war crimes. Many treaty based conventions have condemned Israel war crimes. Now it is all before ICC. I hope it works. Now this solid wall, the edifice of occupation, apartheid, racism and war crimes, can this wall be breached? It must be. There can be no peace without it. But here are some hopeful signs. The past hundred years, within a memory of many people today, witnessed two major world wars, many regional wars, and the demise of abolition of racism, apartheid, fascism, Nazism, Nazism, formal communism, the end of colonies in Asia and Africa. They have all vanished, except in Israel. And we Palestinians moved from a vague appellation as Arab refugees by Europe, we were called Arab refugees, not related to a country, to our recognition by securing a seat at the United Nations, recognized by 130 member st states. To add to this hopeful sign, our young people did not forget, even today, and will never forget. Many of them are in imposed exile in dozens of cities in Europe and USA, in, strangely enough, a modern diaspora of Palestinians. They are professors, lawyers, scientists, even at NASA, media experts, yes, including at CNN, economists, bankers. Some are very ex extremely successful. They all have the components of a successful Palestine, old country reborn, except they are still refugees, denied their right to return home. But now, we have a weapon, a weapon of truth, a weapon of truth, which should be liberating the occupied minds in the West from a long history of misinformation, falsehoods, and deception. This effective weapon does not need tanks, does not need airplanes, does not need millions of lobby dollars. The soldiers in this new world war is the intellectual, that is, the person who knows the truth. It's you and me and millions of other people. It's you in this institution at Suez. It's us in PLSC. This is a war to liberate the minds of the uninformed, the cheated, the deceived, and the silenced. The person of knowledge, the intellectual, should he take up his duty or shrink from it? I leave the answer to Edward Said. He answered this point, and I quote, nothing in my view is more reprehensible than those habits of mind in the intellectual that induce avoidance, that characteristic turning away from a difficult and principled position which you know to be the right one, but which you decide not to take. You do not want to appear too political. You are afraid of seeming controversial. You want to keep a reputation for being balanced." End of quote. I guess, and I hope, there are many who will not shrink from their duty. They know that the power of knowledge is supreme, lasting, liberating. So let me call upon those who know to speak up. Let the innocent and the pure cry out, the emperor has no clothes. Let a map of occupation silence a lying politician. Let facts about brutality 
save a child from being shot on his way to school. Let an image of brutal soldiers save a woman on her way to hospital from dying at checkpoints. I realize that the task is great, but I believe it's doable. That's where you, we, all of us, and institutions of learning come in. I have faith, unshakable faith, that the march of justice will reach its destination. In spite of all this overwhelming power against defenseless Palestinian people, it has not succeeded over seven decades to break their will or to, to demolish their spirit. Their dispersion in the world carried with each one a candle, shining a truth in the darkness about their fate. Yes, I agree, candle light is small and the power of darkness is much greater. But let there be many candles everywhere held by every person of conscience. We will win. No power can suppress the struggle of the human spirit for freedom. So let us all work together so that Palestine people be free. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abu Sitte. That was very emotive and detailed, and you provided a good uh, understanding of the 11 wars. I was intrigued by the title myself and kind of talking about it in different ways. Um, before, we have a few questions that is coming from the audience, and then maybe I can, uh, I can ask some questions in, relate in relation to the... Um, I seem to have, yeah in relation to the, uh, the, new, uh, the new studies center. So one question is asking whether you could have, uh, whether you have published uh, this anywhere, because people are interested in reading about it in, 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 a, in a form or the other. So particularly your historical analysis of these different wars and uh, the, the thematics that you used. Is there, have you published that or is it, Yes, um, we have uh, uh, established Palestine Land Society in London uh, 20 years ago, in the year 2000. And since then, we have published about 400 papers. We published uh, four, five atlases. Uh, we also published uh, poster maps, uh, printed about two million copies of this. All this uh, is um, recorded or reproduced in uh, the website, Palestine Land Society website, www.plands.org, in Arabic and English. And now, um, let me say this, and maybe um, Dr. Hawaida will add, um, the value, uh, or at least uh, I think it is the value of our research, is that it's scientifically based. We actually document Palestine land and people. The land is uh, represented in so many maps digitized by GIS system. We, we know the area of each village. We know um, all the um, infrastructure of the country, what it was, what it is. We can isolate any plot of land. We know how it was and what happened to it. We know also um, we have record of millions of refugees, where they come from, where they are refugees now in which camp. Um, we also have studies related to that in economics and um, law uh, and uh, uh, various other aspects of that. So not only we were able to some degree, at least uh, not done before, uh, of recording Palestine of 1948, but we can we know what is Palestine today, and more importantly, we devised return plans, how Palestinians can return to where, and the system they should follow, the economic structure. We actually have an annual competition uh, among young Palestinian architects 
we hold uh, the results of the competition in London every September. This year, we have 60 students um, um, in the last year of architecture uh, from 12 universities. They are competing uh, in the reconstruction of destroyed villages. We give them a sample of 10 or 20 villages, they select one, and then they uh, actually make a concrete uh, architectural plan for the reconstruction of the village. Of course, with the new population, which is 10 times more, and with the new uh, you know, uh, amenities of the life today. So um, I think instead of, rather than having a library uh, books and shelves, we try to create uh, results-oriented research, as uh, um, Dr. Hoeda said. And I take this advantage, uh, uh, to, this opportunity to, to, to call on all scholars um, to come and join us. Already Dr. Um, Hoeda has received um, letters of interest from uh, scholars interested in Palestine from many countries in, in Europe and America and Arab countries. We, we even have interest from Japan. So we hope um, that this will continue. Maybe Dr. Hoida would like to add something. Yes, um, thank you very much. It's very hard to add to what you just said, Dr. Abu Sitta. Um, I think you uh, covered it very much, but I do just want to emphasize that the idea to promote evidence-based research um, that um, analyzes and, and uses these records to uh, put forth um, arguments and alternative um, discourses. So I'm hoping really that we will be able to do that and invite all of you to uh, look us up in the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Waida. Um, there, there's a question here whether you can give the name of the forthcoming book by uh, Dr. Usama Makadusi and whether do you um, whether whether your talk uh, is going to be published, which you have answered. Uh, but again, whether you can provide a visual map of the occupation, uh, because you talked about the visual maps of occupation, and and someone was asking whether they can find it. But presumably, you have that in the new uh, center that you have started. But uh, you the name of the book of uh, Osama Makadisi, or perhaps we can look for that later on. Um, uh, yes, um, I will provide the name. I heard him speak uh, uh, recently, and I like the idea that uh, he spoke about how um, evil in terms into virtue, how the destruction of Palestinian villages was turned uh, into a society which is tax-free. Uh, its um, uh, declared aim is the environment, improvement of the environment, while in fact it was uh, um, um, a case of uh, uh, looting the property of others and destroying the villages of people who are refugees. And as I said, 372 villages, land of those villages are uh, taken uh, uh, by JNF after 1948. So that when you see kibbutz today run by JNF, you know that this is definitely um, on, a, uh, on a stolen land. And in our website, we outline what these villages are and where they are, and we have maps of that. Okay, fantastic. Um, so there is there are a few other questions from, and we just answered. If I may make a correction, it is Dr. Sari Ma'desi, not Osama Ma'desi, although they're both very well uh, known scholars. So the, it was Sari Ma'desi's book. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, wait. Uh, basically, it, was, uh, it answered the question someone is asking about how can you turn uh, evil into virtue. But I've got one question uh, in relation to the, uh, whether you have addressed or whether you can address the settler colonial context in talking about uh, you know, the, the wars, the 11 wars um, on Israel, uh, sorry, on Palestine. And how, uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you think, another question that came up is, what is your view on uh, kind of proposals for one state solution, which is a little bit different 
uh, but if you can uh, think about answering the one uh, about the settler colonial context. Well, if I may split the answer into two parts. The first part is colonial, settler colonialism. Luckily for advancement of knowledge, this subject is becoming now very important. And actually, surprisingly, it's uh, more prominent among professors in Australia. Um, settler colonialism is a, a new subject to define old crimes committed um, in a new name and new format. The leader in this is the late Patrick Wolf. It is absolutely important to read what he wears. And it says clearly that the aim of the colonials is to settle in a land and to remove, to eliminate the people of the land completely, either by killing them or by throwing them away or by reducing them to non-entities. And of course, meanwhile, to deny that they ever existed. So they always called it terra nullius. Um, that means there are no people there. What they mean is there are, uh, there are people there, but they are not worth any, um, uh, any value. So they should be removed completely. Um, uh, if you just remind me of the second part of the question. Okay, the second part of the question was in relation to the one state solution. Yes, 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 sorry. It's one state solution. We hear this many times. I personally don't subscribe to this or another for a simple reason that recognition or recognition of a state is a political act which can be revoked, can be increased, can be changed. I am not as a Palestinian person interested in one state solution, two state solution. They are immaterial to me. What is of great importance is that the human rights must be applied. The inalienable human rights, namely the right of return, should be applied. When people return to their homes, recover their property, and live in freedom and democracy, not under apartheid, not under racism, not under any oppressive system, then these people live on a piece of land. They call, it, uh, they call themselves citizens of that land. Now, whatever system they choose democratically, it's their own choice. I cannot put the um, carriage before the horse. First, international law must be applied. Human rights must be applied. Right of return must be applied. And then the people of the country decide what kind of future they have, provided there is no racism or apartheid or any kind of oppressive regime. Thank you. Uh, maybe a question to both of you, because there are a couple of questions about internships at the Palestine Land Society, uh, but also uh, whether there's going to be uh, internships in London. That's one question. And the other question is uh, whether there is possibility for undergraduate students to uh, carry out uh, some of the research. Okay, um, I will try to take this Hoyda one. I can answer that, yes. Please do. Please do, Dr. Hoida. Of course, um, we are going to build gradually towards a complete access to affiliated scholars, uh, inviting uh, fellows. Uh, we will establish a fellowship so that people can come and spend time at AUB using the archives um, and also a postdoc position, a professor in the field. Um, but all of this is uh, still uh, to come. We are planning to have uh, the infrastructure for all of that in place, the funding for all of that in place, because we have the generous donation by Dr. Abu Sitta, but we need to raise, to raise funds for an endowment that allows the center to function as a proper research hub with uh, visiting fellows, um, um, interns, um, uh, postdocs to visit and spend time, whether in Beirut or um, virtually to access the um, archives. So hopefully this is all going to happen um, further down the line in the future, uh, but soon. Uh, 
Trump. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Abhishekta, there's a question in relation to, you know, you talked about the role of the intellectual and you quoted Edward Said. Uh, there's a question about, okay, side by side with that, what about the need for political leadership? Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, it, is, it is a tricky subject for, for certain societies because, as you well know, there are several levels. One is to obtain information and record it. Second is to teach people about this information, like in schools or newspapers or research. The third thing is that this information should be converted into political action um, and made into decisions by governments. Now, the first and second is available for Palestinians. They can do research, they can make information available. But when this information becomes, becomes available, it needs to be implemented. And it, implementation needs democracy. That's why we now call very strongly for electing a new Palestine National Council so that the information which is available should be converted into a political strategy and then with the government into a practical plan of action. This link is weak. It is found in democratic countries that information from universities or various political groups and so on rises up to the level of discussion at the parliament and then the ruling party will adopt that program. So here is a link between the intellectual and final result in the field. We don't have that at the moment. What we have nearest to that is the pressure of people, good conscience, like BDS, like university students in many UK universities and many in, in, in USA universities. They create a climate of opinion based on truth and knowledge. They are not afraid to lose financial privileges. They are not afraid to be stigmatized and attacked politically. This is the only um, bright spot for us in the current um, situation of the young people. So to conclude, the knowledge we have um, it has not yet been converted into political action. Even in our case in Palestine Land Society, I regret to say that the authorities in Ramallah very rarely use our information. We offered it to them. They were not, they were reluctant to take it, even free. They, we, we offered uh, information about apartheid war. We could give them maps, we could give them plans for return of refugees, we could give them data, but the link is broken between the knowledge and the political action. And this situation must be remedied, I hope, by electing a new Palestine National Council. Oh, thank you. There is a question from uh, someone, Maybelina O'Neill, which is, they have a Swiss recognized NGO, which is called ARCH Jerusalem, which has created a digital reconstruction of the Mughrabi quarter in Jerusalem. How can you disseminate this on your website? Uh, we would also appreciate advice about how to proceed to have the Mughrabi quarter placed on UNESCO's list of destroyed cultural heritage sites. And if I can ask Maybelina to put the uh, URL in the, uh, in the chat book, on, in, the, in the Facebook chat book, I don't know whether you can do that. Yes. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to hear this. And I would like to... Uh, continue or make contact with this group. The Maghrabi Moroccan quarter of Hart al Magharba in Jerusalem is a supreme example of the destruction of Palestinian heritage. Let me just explain a little bit about that. It was established 800 years ago for the pilgrims from Morocco so that they find a place to live when they are visiting Jerusalem after Mecca. 
they go to pilgrimage in, in Jerusalem. Um, this quarter has been uh, inhabited by uh, Moroccan pilgrims until 1967. In the British survey of Western Palestine, we have maps of that. In 1865, they have uh, charted maps of Jerusalem. And so one week after 1967 war, in June 1967, Israelis came immediately and they demolished, uh, bombed out 160 houses. Some of the people of the houses were buried under the rubble. They destroyed that and they made it into a larger area for uh, praying against the Burakh wall or the Western wall. We at Western uh, Palestine Land Society documented that from aerial surveys, from historical maps, and we the, um, documented them in three dimensions, in GIS maps, and we have complete list of what it was, who lived there, the name of the owners, and you can see it actually in three dimensions, what it was and how it was destroyed. We intend to submit it to UNESCO so that um, to condemn the destruction of 800 years old um, heritage in Palestine. And anyone I would like to, uh, uh, to, to contact the group you mentioned, because we'll tell them what maps and the reports we have. Um, we have also the title deeds of the ownership of this land from Ottoman archives. Um, I would be very pleased to you know, get in touch with uh, this group. Well, thank you very much. That, that is uh, brilliant. And maybe if they can send an email to you uh, so that they can connect and see how uh, they can work with you in the new center. Uh, there's a question about what do you think about the normalization of relations between the Arab states and Israel? Um, uh, recently, you know, we've had the United Arab Emirates and uh, other countries. So if you have any comment on that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I ask anyone who reads about that to answer this question. What is normalization? Normalization for the layman is um, dealing with a country as a normal country. What does that mean? It means that the Nakba committed by Israel against three quarters of Palestinians is a moral act. It's a correct act. It's a legal act. It is, uh, it is uh, something to be praised. And therefore, all the crimes committed by Israel and Palestinians are not crimes, really. They are virtues. They are good things we should celebrate, we should approve of. Therefore, uh, the crimes committed by Israel not only are forgiven, but are found to be of great human value. And therefore, we deal with Israel that uh, on the basis that their um, actions against Palestinians over 72 years um, is moral, legal, perfect, and logical. That means, that means actually it draws a great legal uh, guilt on those people because according to statute of Rome, anyone who commits a crime and anyone who orders a crime and anyone who aids and abets a crime and anyone who approves of a crime is a criminal. Therefore, normalization really is a war crime in that sense. And therefore, those knowingly or not knowingly who actually go into the path of normalization, it means they are aiding abetting war crimes. And so they should be taken to ICC as well. That is good, thank you. Um, so there's a question saying, you know, if we want to make some progress uh, going forward, uh, maybe what about, you know, we, we've spoken about the Palestinian trauma. Um, what about the Jewish trauma? What is your response to that? Response to that? You know, kind of talking about the Jewish trauma as well as talking about the Palestinian trauma. 
Yes, uh, the answer to me is very clear. When I was 10 years old, I became a refugee. And at that time, I never saw a Jew in my life. I don't know they lo how they look like. I don't know what language they speak. They came to us in smuggler ships in the middle of the night. They, as I mentioned, they came as an army, 120,000. They attacked my own village, Al Ma'in, with 24 armored vehicles in the middle of the night. They destroyed our homes. They destroyed the school which my father built. And they destroyed our wells. And they destroyed our crops. And this is what I know about them. Now, if they have a grievance somewhere else, why should I pay for it? If they have grievances uh, about something happened to them in Europe, the answer is they should go to the place where that is committed, try to find the answer. Uh, I do not find any legal or human or any reason that I should bear um, the burden of what happened to somebody somewhere else. And one time I had correspondence with Uri Avnery and we talked a lot about these matters. And you know, he is accredited to be <coughs> what's called uh, uh, a prophet of peace. I told him, why did you come? You were in Irgun, a terrorist organization. Why did you help in depopulating about 100 villages in Southern Palestine with your machine gun? He said, well, that was the case some time ago. Uh, I told him, if you, you he, your name is Helmut, you are German. Why are you fighting us? I told him it's a matter of cowardice that you left the field where they have committed these things against you and came to defenseless people miles away, hundreds of miles, a thousand miles away to kill defenseless people you have, whom you have not seen at all. So this is my argument, very simple. What happened to me is wrong historically, legally. If anyone uh, disagrees with that, that's their problem. I'm not going to carry the burden of disasters or, or atrocities committed elsewhere. So there is another question around the role of Fatah um, in, in kind of some of the issues that are continuing to happen in terms of corruption and so on. Uh, do, you th you know, do, do you think that you could answer this question in a sense, you know, talking about whether Fatah is impeding um, uh, or has played a role in, um, in the continuous uh, problem for Palestinians. Uh, if I understand you correctly, what is the role of Fatah, the ruling uh, uh, party in the West Bank? Yes, it seems that that's one of the questions. I'm just going to try and find it again uh, and read it to you um, as it comes. Uh, but before we do that, uh, maybe there is uh, a, another question that says, uh, should the campaign not, you know, for kind of improving the uh, political uh, situation, uh, not include the freeing of Palestinian political uh, prisoners, and especially the important figures like Marwan Barghouti and Ahmed Sadat. Um, also, the unity of Fatah and Hamas is vital, so perhaps you could uh, think or, or respond to these as uh, factors for helping um, the liberation of the Palestinian people? Well, these are detailed questions. Probably some people are more qualified than me to answer them. But I have a general answer which uh, satisfies me all the time. Since Oslo, 1993, we have been, a group of Palestinians have been campaigning against Oslo. And I am proud to mention Haider al Shafi, Edward Said, Ibrahim Abulogod, all others. For the last 25 years, we have been campaigning to bring back democracy into Palestinian structures, namely electing a Palestinian National Council. Now, the uh, uh, elections which are planned now are uh, faulty in many ways because the main structure we have 
is Palestine National Council established in 1964. And the only legal representative of the Palestinian people is that council elected by 13 million Palestinians. And when that is elected, they have to decide in all these matters. These are secondary matters created because we don't have Palestine National Council uh, generally accepted and properly elected uh, with leadership which has the trust um, of the people. This is not the case now. So all what's happening now is interim measures which will not lead to the correct and lasting solution. Okay, thank you. And I found the question about Fatah, which says, I would like to know more about the corruption in Fatah and what is your evaluation of the harm it has caused through the, through the years on the Palestinian cause? Well, I, I repeat my answer. Uh, the, only, the only answer which satisfies the, uh, the Palestinians, all of them, is election of Palestine National Council, not the Legislative Council, not the local election to be held in the West Bank, uh, but uh, elections in which 13 million people decide. The, this is the essence of PLO. This is the essence of Palestine National Council. This is the time we moved from uh, uh, a group of refugees into a nation which has a country called Palestine. Now, unfortunately, since Oslo, the cards have been played in so many different ways and fragmentation has happened. We should fight this fragmentation. There is now a movement among Palestinians outside the West Bank and Gaza, everywhere, young people, old people in, in Europe and in America, they are saying this, unless there is Palestinian National Council representing all of us, anything else is faulty and not acceptable. And, and how do you see this council coming through? You know, what are the uh, prospects for the Palestine National Council to be formed given, uh, given the, the current situation uh, amongst the Palestinians and the current political situation with regards to the Palestinians? What are the steps for this council to be? Because I, I agree with you, I think we really need the Palestine National Council, but, but how is it? you know, this movement, where is it gathering pace? What are they doing? Can you tell us about uh, where we can find more information around? Yes, yes. Um, as I say, um, over the last 25 years, we held many conferences about that. Um, it did not yield any results because those people who are holding the keys uh, in Ramallah would not give it up and they converted the situation of Palestine as a country depopulated and its people are refugees into a system uh, working under Israeli occupation, accepting Oslo, which is devastating. And um, they wanted to live in that environment and they have no interest because they have their own private interests, non-national interest to do that. So it's a big battle. And there are, if you watch the, um, the news media, or at least the Facebooks and so on, there are many groups are forming now among Palestinians outside the West Bank and Gaza. They are saying, we do not accept anything short of election for, um, for, um, for all Palestinians. Now, the question which the questioner asked is what steps are they, are they taking? Since this is a people's movement, it takes time, but there are many, if you look in the uh, Facebooks and various other means, there are meetings to be held um, at the end of February in early March. Um, people are gathering forces in order to claim their right to be representative. If you see, if the questioner sees any of these, I um, uh, encourage them to join them. There is a group called Samidun. There is a, a group called Aidun. There is a group called PYM, Palestinian Youth Movement. There, are, there is a group called Pop, 
popular conference of Palestinians abroad, all of those have the same aim. When we have enough uh, accumulation of people uh, who will claim that, who will demand that, um, then perhaps there is um, a solution. At the moment, I can say with, with certainty, 90% of Palestinian people do not accept what's going on, do not accept the representation by uh, Ramallah group. Thank you. Um, Gilbert, do you have any questions? Do you want to come in with some questions? And there's someone who said they had their hands up amongst the audience, but I cannot see how we can let you in to, to ask a question until you can find a way. But Gilbert, do you have uh, any question? <clears throat> no, thank you, Dina, but just uh, a remark made by uh, one uh, member of the audience who wrote, uh, this is an absolutely brilliant synopsis of what has and is going on and asking, will it be published anywhere? So the question is to Dr. Abu Sitta about uh, the publication of uh, this text, if he intends to publish it somewhere, of course, we would be very happy to, 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 pu to publish it uh, ourselves. Well, first, let me say hello, Dr. Gilbert. Nice to see you in a picture. We have not met uh, for some time. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with friends. Um, uh, uh, you mean publishing of what? You mean this talk or? Your talk, yes, exactly, the text. Yes, yes, we'll post it in our website, Palestine Land Society. Let Excellent. me put an ad here. It's called www.plands.org, plands.org will be published. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. There's another question that just came in, which is um, with this activism happening by uh, the Palestinians uh, outside the homeland, uh, is there any space for some members who are from the Jewish diaspora to support these actions? Do you see, do you see that kind of support happening? Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a good question. In the last quarter of a century, I had the chance to befriend a number of these groups and I find them genuine. Of course, the top of the line is Elan Pepe, but there are others. When I speak at Harvard and Boston area, where people are more enlightened, almost half my audience at the university are young American Jews. Some of them come to me actually and say, we have been deceived. We have been educated in um, uh, schools when we are young that Palestine is empty and uh, that God given land. And, and now when we go, we find it very different. One of them actually visited the West Bank and he actually went to the refugee camps and he decided to live in a refugee camp. He came back to the United States and became a very great advocate of, of that. Now, uh, I have seen many of them, but I must say the degree of their commitment to Palestinian national rights varies. In Ilan Papi case, it's absolute, 100%. Others have various degrees on scale of supporting Palestine. And this is not the place to discuss that, but I welcome any, uh, you know, any any progress towards recognizing what happened to Palestinians by people who have never done them any harm. Um, as I say, there are limits to their support, but whatever it is, it's welcome and should be recognized. But I must tell you one thing, if you give me just one minute. When I published my memoirs, uh, I wrote to about 10 or 20 Jewish groups who have been with us in demonstrations, signing petitions and uh, meeting conferences. You know, first class, first class. I told them now that you have read my memoirs, I would like you to know the following. In my land, which is 55,000 dunams, Al Ma'in, there are four kibbutzim. And I gave them the names, told them, just write to these settlers in, in the four kibbutz in my land. Ask them three simple questions. First, do you know how you got there? How did you get there in 1948? 
walking, playing, by parachute. How did they come there? Second question is, do you know the people who were living there before you came, where are they? Do you know they are one kilometer away in Gaza Strip? The third thing is, uh, what do you say if these people have never given up their right to return home? In my case, I could, I could walk one kilometer back to a place where I was born. Now, surprising results of about 10 or 12 Jewish groups I asked, not one of them dared to speak to the kibbutz on my land, not one. They tell me various things. Do you know their addresses? I don't know the addresses. I said, yes, okay, here are the addresses of the kibbutz. Someone said, would I use my name or shall I use another name? I said, it's up to you, I know the answer. Another one said, I know some other Jew there who could do it. I'll tell him to do it. I am amazed, amazed. That's why I said there is always a degree of support. Not one of the people who are with us in demonstrations, signing petitions, would dare to address settlers in my land. Just tell them simple questions. What do you say to that? What do you say to that? How do you explain that? Yeah. And there is a question just come in uh, about, you know, how can we revive, uh, how can we revive European support for the Palestinian cause? Um, do you think you are, you can answer that question or is it too big and broad? Well, well we have to address it, even though it's a difficult question, we have to address it. And, 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 and maybe uh, I'm probably a bit naive, but I believe in the human spirit. Um, who would guess BDS would gain support in European universities? And they did. Who would guess there is PSC, PSC, Palestinian Solidarity Campaign in England, who has probably 200,000 uh, interested persons? Who would guess that? And, and of course, there is a great deal of, um, I mean, you have to be, you have to be a fighter to do that. Because now the defamation, which is one of the 11 wars, is acting very strongly. I mentioned the case of Nerit Somerville. She is a, a Jewish German person. She is a musician. She holds uh, concerts and so on. And Jews in Germany love her. But she said, I will not tolerate that Palestinians are dispossessed because of Israel. And she is, She's subject of witch hunt. And, and so uh, IHRA, as you will know, um, luckily many universities uh, turned it down. But there is something now uh, uh, which was not given before. This is called uh, um, anti-Semitic uh, accusation. I will not go into that, but if anyone is accused of that, you should ask, what did he say? Did he tell you about Palestine? The case in Palestine is very well documented. Now, who would deny that? The one who denies that is the criminal. The only person who is afraid of the truth is the criminal. Because if you are not criminal, you have no problem of telling people all the facts because you know you are innocent, you have not done it. So this is really uh, a turn to the worse uh, instead of having you no know, media. Let me just remind you of one thing. After 1967, people in the Western world heard about the word occupation, Israeli occupation. And it really opened their eyes, Israeli occupation. They were the trodden people. They were the people who were trying to find a safe haven in the world. And, and then the uh, Intifada, first Intifada came. So this is one way of jolting the Western duped uh, uh, mindset. And that's why I say the only weapon uh, today we have is the truth. Uh, let, me, let me just add one thing. In our work, which is scientific, mapping, historical, not one Israeli ever disputed any uh, atlas we made or any map we made. Benny Morris, 
wrote about first atlas three parts review he was trying he had a group of students picking every single page every number and he could not find anything then his complaint which he published in the united states and i think in, in england uh, is me ah dr abu sitta is he aims to rebuild palestine good for you yes this is what i intended that is good so a final a final question and a final comment from you on uh, whether you can you know whether you are able to chart or tell us about a path forward uh, towards about what sorry about what to chart a path forward you know is that is that a road map that we can follow uh, to try and uh, resolve the questions and and to end the wars against palestine against palestine well I, I claim there is the answer, uh, and we know that the answer is available. So much time, but nobody would dare to do it. Uh, the right of return. Look, if I may summarize the situation in Palestine in one sentence, it is not this. It is not that. It is not conflict. It is not. It is simply people have been depopulated from their country, and they are determined to return back. That's it. That's it. So the international law is on our side. But with the scientific data we have, we made a plan how to return. The first thing I have done, which is published anyway, is could people return? Who is now living in their homes, in their lands? So we had a huge database who lives in each village land. whether it's russian or it's ashkenazi which is arab jew and so on who live there and this study is published in 1995 i came to the conclusion that israel is empty people thought this is crazy how come how come israel is empty and uh, people say all the time okay okay what happened to palestinians Uh, is very bad but are you going to create nakba for jews because they are already filling the place this is false absolutely false the study we have made proved that 87% of the jews live in 12% of israel and the refugee land is almost empty out of 4500 village lands half of them have no jews today the other half has 1 to 2% jews who are in the kibbutz therefore if they return even if the kibbutz stays it will not affect anything the problem resides in three areas only only the area of metropolis of jaffa and tel aviv one two haifa third western jerusalem these are areas in which they have high concentration and they obliterated 12 villages only out of 560 and who controls the village land other than kibbutz 85% or no 75% of the area in israel is controlled by the israeli army by israeli army they have they have training fields they have factories they have this and that I'm not inventing these numbers. Look at the study made by 250 Israeli experts in 1984 called Israel 2020, and these figures are given there, and we check them; they are correct. So, if people return, they will have very few people in their in, in, in their face to stop it. it. The question is not really logistics. I have even created cantons for the remaining Jews, and we have an area described uh, in our website how you can create three cantons: West Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, where most of them can live, the majority, up to 87 percent, without effect to other people. They can, you know, have any kind of system there. Yeah. So it is not law; international law is our side. It is not uh, uh, difficulty of logistics and so on. 
absolutely not, absolutely. Even rebuilding, rebuilding these um, uh, uh, the destroyed villages, we have the agenda and the budget for that. Palestinians can do it. If you see our competition, as I mentioned, the young people are designing reconstruction of these villages beautifully, beautifully. We even brought these designs to refugee camps. For example, we had a winner last year, Suhmata village. We had people in refugee camps in Lebanon meet those young people who designed it. And they found it very clear. They loved it. It's very doable with no external manpower from outside, with, with even little money from outside. So um, what is stopping us? Uh, what's stopping us? United States and uh, Israel by physical force, not by law, not by logistics, but not by any other means. Thank you so much. We're coming to the end of the talk and I think you ended it brilliantly uh, by, by, by making positive uh, approaches and practical approaches to some type of progress. Uh, I think we have had many comments saying this is an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Huwaida, as well. Looking forward to collaboration. You are very welcome. And, and sending students to you. Uh, and thanks, uh, everyone, and Gilbert for being here. Gilbert, do you want to say something before we end? Because No, no, Dina, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And of course, thank you. With many thanks to our two guests for this uh, brilliant uh, evening. Thank you. And as Aki put in the chat, we have the annual lecture, uh, Center for Palestine Studies, on the 5th of uh, March, coming up too soon, and hope we can see a lot of you there, uh, of the attendees. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks, and uh, uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Thank you very much. I only hope that we get rid of Corona soon, because I'd like to visit you and see you in person as before. We have coffee together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Aki. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Thank you.